Yeah, hey! Apparently, according to Eric over there, we are live, Michael. How are you, my friend? I am amazing. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thank you. Michael is the most patient man in the world. This is the third attempt at us doing a live stream. Um, and uh, we're finally back. Although we've done them before, but yes, we're finally big, bad and back. Exciting to have here you. Here we are. Yeah. My pleasure, sir. Always a pleasure. This, uh, it, you know, I don't want to play favorites, but you, you are my favorite. When it comes to live streaming, it's like we, you and I, well, we share so much in common with our musical tastes. Um, which actually yep. sounds sounds like my ego talking because your mu musical taste is so <laughs> impeccable. It's so oh, impeccable. Nonsense. I am nonsense. I'm sounding like I'm trying to align myself with you, which is uh, it's an always an honor to talk to you. Um, yeah, you and and I, I don't know, and you've made some of the best sounding records of all time. It's Thank just you. what can I say? And everybody I know uh, that's at your level also thinks that you've made some of the best sounding records of all time. It's also great when peers share that. It's really great. I'm extremely appreciative. And one of the other things is you're always so kind about people. You know, when we, you, you and I first met and I brought up Dave Jordan, you were just like, oh, I love Dave. He's such a great engineer and giving my best. And which sort of brings me to, I suppose, where I'd like to start with. Um, and obviously, uh, sorry, everybody out there, please give us some questions for, for Michael. I will ask him questions. But I wanted to start with because we just off camera, before we've been off camera for about 10 minutes before we came on, talked about um, the Chili Peppers. And yeah. I'm a big fan. And I said, I couldn't remember the year. I don't know if it was 87 or 88, but I saw them at the Marquee um, with a very good friend of mine um, many, um, many, you know, many years ago now. And it was insane, like, to watch, <laughs> like, this punk, funk bass player. <laughs> like, Flea was just insane. And the energy... It was incredible. The only thing I remember thinking that came close energy wise was probably like when I saw HR. I remember HR mm. cartwheeled on stage. The band came <laughs> out and and they were just playing and then HR like cartwheeled onto the stage and that was and that was also at the marquee. Those are like two shows for me in the late eighties that were just like completely and utterly um you know, responsible for my love of music. So <laughs> I'm touched. I'm glad to have participated in that. I mean, what what a record! Pa I mean, Mofo Party. What a what an incredible album. What was that experience like? Well, thank you. Uh, that was making that record was absolutely hair raising from from <laughs> from stem to stern. Uh, I it was it was kind of like my introduction to making to producing records on my own because up till that point. I'd, I mean, I had my only big success working as part of a team when I worked with Herbie Hancock and we did Rocket. So I'd done a couple of small records for like Canadian bands, which is not a way of disparaging working up in Canada. But back then in the United States, everyone was kind of like, it, it, I mean, if you've worked with a Canadian band, it's almost as if you've never worked with anybody, <laughs> which is kind of, that's how they treated me, you know, or I, I think anyone else in my position. So if you'd knock on an A&R person's door to take a meeting, they'd be like, who are you? You know, what have you done? I've worked with some Canadian bands like, OK, see ya. I'm now I'm, I'm glad I know that you're here. Um, so working with the Chili Peppers was extraordinary because it was my first gig as a solo producer. And it was, you know, I, I, obviously I was elated beyond belief that I could get this gig. But it only occurred to me later on why I was able to get it. And it was mainly because no one else in the world, I think, would have wanted to touch it at that point, given their position with the record company. And I think that they're, it, they interband issues, which are mainly drug related. And here I was at 26 years old, being confronted with all these things at once that I think a person in my position who might have had like 10 years on me and a lot more records under their belt, they would have just turned around and be like, nope, sorry, got to go. It was th the amount of drama and stress that was involved in making it, dealing with the drug issues, trying to get the band together to work as a unit. Um, and then when we finally got that done, there was a whole 
like we had to demo the record for EMI. And oh, wow. yeah, we had to present them with finished demos before they would let us go in the studio. Yeah, exactly. Very odd stimul- stipulation. Yeah. Um, no one explained to me that there might be a condition once we turned in the demos that someone might actually reject them. They were just like, we, j- we just want to hear finished demos. So I did that and we ran up against some stuff. Mm, you know, so again, I got dropped into the pool at the deepest possible end at the tender age of 26. And it was to this day, I'm not sure how that record got even got to like the starting gate, let alone completed and released. It was just nonstop drama. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, it's such a great record. I mean, but I suppose, you know, most of the records that I absolutely love seem to have a story. Now, does that mean does that mean we love the record so we we want to find out and so we get the story, or is it just true that great albums seem to come out of you know a bit of strife a bit of um i think you know one of the things i love about your production and we've talked on all the times we've talked about super unknown and other such incredible records my feeling about you and i've said this on to you and on camera many times before is like you you're a uh, leave no stone stone unturned producer you're like you want to know <laughs> if there if there's a lyric you want to know why are you saying that you know you you're when we talked about how you record bass and drums like the idea of like putting subs in the room under a drum riser so there's more low end in the room so the drums sound fatter putting a sub in a in a in a like a closet kind of room for a a bass amp to get more low end just so it bleeds into the mic you know these are these are like the differences you know and i think that's our perception of, of Michael Beinhorn is that he is a producer that's not just going to be like, yeah, that's good enough. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't think good enough is not in your vocabulary. Um, I think that you've, you, you've hit on a truism there. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, I just feel like life's too short for that kind of thing. You know, in, in my position as a producer, I have two options. I can either try and do as many records as I, as I possibly can and I guess subsist off the you know, off my retainer, my advance to do the record and kind of let it be that. Or I can put a little bit of myself into the process and act as a collaborator for the artist, which I feel is more valuable. And it's also more satisfying for me. So that means that I've, I've invested myself in the process more. Uh, and it's, you know, I mean, it's there, there's a the only the drawback to that is that you start you kind of have a personal stake in it, and you begin to be you get a little proprietary over what you're working on, which is I mean, it's it's inevitable because we're human and stuff like that. But you know, I I think it's worth it in the long run if you're able to cr- help an artist create something that's going to outlast you know you and the artist. And I like to feel that to some extent we may be on that track you know, with records like Uplift, people are still into it now. Uh, you know, it was a it was a very modest release when it came out, but it's obviously cracked a million records since the Chili Peppers have gotten so big. So, you know, it's it's done OK. <laughs> but and, and then how did that fold into that experience into doing the, 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 the record afterwards? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that was Wow. I mean, that was just as action packed in its own way. I mean, it was just it. it, Those guys just had this like uncanny knack for attracting drama. I think I I have a feeling that the two records that I did with them may have sucked most of that out of them. Uh, I think that they they came to a point where they'd matured so much that they got to see that there are a lot of things in life that are extraneous to the recording project, or if you have to absolutely have those things in your life, that you leave them outside the recording studio once you go into work. You have to set those things aside. But when we made those two records, oh boy, (laughs) it wasn't anything like that at all. 
Well, I mean, they were they were obviously super super young, um, and and I had no real experience. I I I, I I I'm not sure I was quite that crazy in the studio on my first album as a musician, but I certainly was a lot crazier than I was after ten years of making records. Yeah, so I understand yeah, what you're sure. saying. So yeah. they just they just been through that. Plus, I mean, they were from they were from Hollywood and they were feral. You know, yeah. there was just like anything that you can imagine was was on offer there. I'm I'm actually in the process of writing books about these records. So that should be very interesting Great. for people to get a lot of inside information on how those records actually were made and what took place in the process. That was actually a question just came up. Um was are you doing another book? So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm actually doing a series of books. Uh and I guess about seven or eight of them are just going to be on some records that I've worked on specifically uh, in a way that, uh, that no one's ever really done before, because I find that people tend to kind of focus on very um, superficial aspects of the recording process. Of course. And they, don't get, they don't get into the kind of like the, the boots on the ground type stuff, mainly because I think that they don't want to rub anyone the wrong way. But I think at this point it's, valuable to have the information out there for people to see what that what the recording process actually is like and if there's a story to the to the recording what it actually was at least from the perspective of someone who was involved directly in the process because you know you've worked on records before where there's i'm sure there's been crazies i mean obviously aerosmith those guys were you know in there they, they were well past the point where they needed to, to be nuts in the studio but with Steven, there's always a little bit of drama, right? They were still nuts in the studio. That's all I can say. I, I don't, I, yeah, it may, yeah. They, they probably weren't as dangerous as when they were 25 years old. Definitely. Um, it oh, couldn't yeah. cause as much trouble. But no, I don't think, yeah, you've worked with Steven. So, yes, Steven's going to be that crazy artist no matter what. He's in every oh, yeah. detail, every single thing. And oh he, yeah, and he can play every instrument just enough to get in on every single person's instrument and cause some chaos. But out of that chaos, of course, <laughs> comes comes br brilliance. You know, it's, yes, yes, it's dangerous too because he's always a little smarter than most everyone in the room. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. So he knows you can't really sneak a whole lot past him, and it's hard to get him on board with something unless he's at, unless he absolutely understands it and like can, can get the functionality of it, you know, but if he doesn't see that, he'll fight you hard. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I think, um, I think the other thing is, is his work ethic was just absolutely insane. Uh, when, when, when I worked with him, he was doing uh, American Idol for about half the album and he would come in at 10 a.m., and work until the filming time. So he'd work for a couple of hours, then he'd go and film, and then he'd come back at seven and work till midnight or two o'clock in the morning. So he'd, he yeah. would film American Idol and then still manage to work 10 or 12 hours around it. Yeah. But it was. That's Steven. Yeah. 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 He's extraordinary. You know, it's funny because his limits far outstrip those of most other people's. But I noticed that when he, when he was done, he was like, I'm done. He just, yeah. he just knew when to stop and go like, I'm not doing anymore. I can't do anymore and I don't want to. And that was it. What I, what I loved uh, most about him was, was um, cause one of the things I enjoy slash hate about what we do is vocal comping because it mm. is the most important part of what we do. Cause you comp that vocal and you bring out all of the passion in a performance. It's the most important thing in a song. So I love it. But then at the same time, sitting down in front of a computer or back in the in the day in front of a console with with you know doing mutes and and, and etc could can be hours and hours and hours of work and then you come back and you're not happy with it and you've got to, it's so it's a love hate thing because you know yeah i love it because it's the most important thing and i relish it but also the hours of work with steven it was the best experience because he self comps he will sing and then he'll stop and go play that back and he'll play it back. And the thing that you noticed, he immediately knows he has to fix. Plus something you didn't notice, he wants to fix. And so we would sing for an hour and a half. And at the end of the hour and a half, we had a comped vocal and it was amazing. 
Oh, he's such a pro. I love that. <laughs> I love guys with work ethics like that. That's amazing. Chris actually had a work ethic like that as well, Cornell. He was extraordinary. I actually saw him. I, I comped a vocal on uh, Super Unknown one time, actually for Black Hole Sun. Uh, I comped a vocal on that song. And he came in to hear it. And we played it down. And he just turned to me and was like, nope, no good. I have to do it over. It was wow. amazing, though, because he didn't turn to me and go like, you did a shitty comp. He was like, he was like, I have to sing it over. He recognized that he just hadn't hit it. And he was 100% right as well. You know, I've never vocalists. I, I'm sure you've seen this as well. Being that they're so self-conscious and generally speaking, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to be a vocalist because the voice is the only instrument that, that comes directly out of a human body. You know, it's the only instrument that we can actually produce completely by ourselves. You know, so I find that vocalists tend to be very, very, you know, they, they're very touchy about things that they do. Certainly if someone else says it, but I'd never before seen a vocalist just shred their own, voc their own work like that. It was incredible to watch that. I, I, I love people who are able to be pragmatic to that extent like that artists obviously in particular yeah yeah no i tell you, I, that that's an, an amazing to know i think a, quite a few of the first questions that came up were about super unknown um it's hard to get past it's such a hugely important record um as well as being an incredible sounding record um thank you it, it, it is interesting when you do an album with artists in their career it always seems to be my favorite album of those artists. I mean, <laughs> Thank you. and I, uh, th I think that's a very common theme um, amongst us all. Um, I also have this theory, and you can shoot me down, that, you know, you challenge them so much that they're probably afraid to want to come back. Like, <laughs> can, it, can, it, can it be a little easier next time? You know what I mean? But uh, I think they all look back. they all look back and go, oh, it's our best record. You know, yeah, um, but it's but it's also difficult to um, yeah, on a, on a record on that record and a and a lot of the other records I've done where it was sort of like a one shot thing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because there's so many ingredients involved. I mean, yeah, it kind of was a one shot thing. So it's you know, I think when an artist would go on to do their next record, they wouldn't you know they wouldn't want to do it with me. I would be I would be mildly insulted by it, but I had to really kind of look at it and go, that record was so intense. It was so difficult and so trying that it's, you know, and also if if I'd gone back in the studio with that artist, we would there's no way around this. We would have tried to recreate what we've done to a certain extent, like human the human mind is designed to seek formula. You know, it just is. Because, I mean, think about how, I, I'll draw an analogy here. You know, you go to open a door. Think about the first time in your life you ever actually did that. You know, or something that involved mechanical skills where you actually had to think, how about this, trying to drive a car. First time you tried to drive a car, right? You're like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like, what foot goes where? Uh, you know, and everyone does this whole stop start thing with the car, you know, but you've done it a couple of times, you drive easily. So the whole process to me of making a record like that, like the first time round with an artist and having really high aspirations for it at the same time, you're basically in this state of beginner mind, you know, like you're like a child approaching the whole thing. You don't know your way around. You have to consciously formulate this whole methodology about how you're going to do this, how you're going to do that, you know? And so by the time, if you go back the second time around, there's a part of you that's going to be familiar with the process. You know, the individuals, you know what you're doing. Um, although I, 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 I'm contradicting myself to a certain extent because with the chili peppers, I made two records that sounded completely different from one another. But at the same time, that band, those bands were completely different because they each had two different members. You know, they had a different uh, guitarist and, and uh, drummer on each. 
So that was an important part of the, you know, of that, uh, of that recipe. With Soundgarden, if we'd gone back in the studio, I'm pretty sure that we, that to a certain extent, even though some of us might have resisted, we probably there would have been a, a like a very overriding mindset that would have gotten us to try and repeat aspects of that record and it wouldn't have worked. So in many respects, it's a good thing that we didn't. Yeah. But what's interesting is I, I think the, the chili peppers is a good example, but when I think of inside of an album, like super unknown, it doesn't sound formulaic. So I, I'm not trying to be contrary to what you're saying, but for me, I feel like your approach is uniqueness of every song. So where I do agree that there may have been things like the recording techniques that may have been adopted from one to another, because, you know, when we talk about like Celebrity Skin or Super Unknown of that period, they stand out sonically from all the rest of the records that the bands did. I mean, the, the whole the whole difference is like massive. You've got like indie indie record to suddenly like huge, massive, fat sounding, you know, record. Mm -hmm. And then they go back to making another indie record. Do you know what I mean? And and. I don't mean indie in a negative way. I'm not trying to be, you know, because both no, 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 of my, sure, sure. my favorite artists are, are independent artists. We love it all, you know. But, it, oh, it, yeah. it, you, you know, there, there's what I love about the, the, the growth of the Chili Peppers between those two albums is the first album is like punk funk and it's all energy and it smash you over the head and it just completely captures it. And then, you know, the next album pretty much sets them up. Yeah, for the for the band that yeah. they beca they became, um, and um, you know, with, like I was saying off camera, I'm a big big fan of the Chili Peppers, and I know it's there's there there it seems to be popular at the moment to be you know negative about them. I don't I don't think that has any merit really. I feel like they're always, you know, I suppose it's like the Stones, you know, because the Stones probably get similar kinds of criticism. You know, we we all like want our bands to be a certain memory, don't we? I think oh, I'm guilty of it. We have a we have a fondness for a certain period and a certain sound. And we're like, with the Stones, it's like, well, you know, let it bleed. Why aren't they still doing let it bleed? Or maybe, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? It's... Oh yeah, it's totally our projection onto the artists. You know, most people aren't willing to let their artists go and develop artistically. That's one reason why I respect David Bowie so much because mm. he was able to he was able to change so drastically and so frequently across his entire career. You know, I mean, he was always the same artist inevitably, but stylistically and visually as well, he just became so many different personalities. It was really extraordinary. And he did that without I mean, it's seamlessly it appeared like you know, he just sort of was like, okay, now I'm going to be this. Now I'm going to be that. Absolutely. And he just did it. And I'm sure he was extremely conscious that he was going to piss people off when he did stuff like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, to move from like a rock artist making sort of like really like trashy glam rock into someone who's essentially making disco records. That was a really bitter pill for a lot of his fans to swallow, you know, but I mean, Young Americans and Station to Station are two of his best records. Yep, yep. You know? Well, I think the thing for Bowie, um, uh, which I think I, I wish a lot of bands would, would take notice of, is, yes, he did these incredible stylistic changes in production and uh, visuals and everything around it. But he had this main, he maintained the incredible songwriting. And I think one of the things yep. I was shaking bands is, it's all very well to be hip and cool and trendy and whatever and cutting edge and stuff like that. But give me a song, you know, give me yeah. a song. I mean, you talk about uh, young Americans. It's a freaking a staple of Bowie's career. It's such an incredible song. It is. It is. And a lot of the songs off station to station. Are I mean, you just yeah. listen to it and go, God, this guy's so good. Yeah. You know, like he, he just, Oh, what a shift over like, you know, 10, 15 years he made. But, you know, when you speak about songs, getting back to the Chili Peppers, like whether you like them stylistically or not, and that's a personal thing, it's it's very difficult to argue with their success, which has been based around the fact that someone in the band is able to write songs. You know, when they, I mean, Hillel 
Slovak, the original guitarist. Um, it, well, it, let's see, it was Hillel, then Jack Sherman, then Hillel again. Uh, he was a really unique stylist, but he wasn't a songwriter. These guys were not songwriters. They were a jam band. They would put ideas together and then they put a vocal on top. That's how it worked. When Frashanti joined the band, that was the first time that they actually had someone who was able to compose melodically and harmonically and incorporate those ideas together to create songs that the band could then extrapolate from and introduce rhythmic ideas. So it was a complete reversal in many respects. You know, I mean, obviously Flea and, and he worked together on a lot of the songs as well. So Flea is part of that, that nucleus, but it wasn't the same as when they worked with Hillel because Hillel was not a songwriter. And ultimately I feel the success of that band is really determined by who's playing guitar because the guitar, because that person is going to be a songwriter. John can write songs. His sense of his, his sense of composition is very, very advanced, you know, and he just happens to be superhumanly gifted at it. You know, I mean, the Chili Peppers have definitely turned into more of like a ballad band at this stage, although I haven't listened to the rest of their 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 new record so i'm i can't really speak the to new, that new, the new record is great actually it's it's it it definitely feels like a return to form it's a it's a tape record i think they they work really hard to be a band that you could put mics in front of and record right. so it definitely feels like that i think you'll enjoy it. i think you'll 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 probably hear some of the the essence of what you loved about them when you were working with them it i i'm, I'm impressed that's, that's great yeah i mean they they're, they're one of the best bands in the world. I, you know, I, I, if anyone wants to, wants to disparage that, that's, that's fine. We're all entitled to our opinions. However, having worked with those guys in a recording studio, and I'm, I'll speak just about the instrumentalists in the band, they're some of the best players I've ever worked with. Yeah, you know, they, they truly are. And Anthony, everyone, people can have their complaints about him as a, as, as a singer, because he's not really much of a singer, but he's an extraordinary vocalist. Yep, I he's agree. an extraordinary. His presence is unlike anyone I've ever worked with, um, and he's extremely talented. And there's a reason why he's where he is right now. I mean, growing up with you know rock and roll. I mean, obviously, I love jazz and blues and 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 uh, and and R and B and and I grew up on all of that stuff and soul. But the thing about rock and roll that I used to love. That I still love, I should say, is Mick Jagger. You know, like I can't get no, 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 no. It's not three octave range. It's like we 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 don't talk about Mick Jagger as not being a classically trained, you know, uh, singer with a massive range. We don't care. It's all about the attitude. And and to me, Anthony and Mick Jagger are those kinds of singers. I love Freddie Mercury. I consider him to be the greatest rock singer of all time. Bowie's really high up there with with range and personality. But the personality part is what makes rock and roll so unique, you know, bringing oh, yeah. character and voice. So I wanted to say, while we were talking about Super Unknown, somebody commented, said, true story, I got caught skipping school to get Super Unknown the day it came out. I got suspended <laughs> for two days and spent the whole two days listening to the album. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your heart. Yeah, thank, you from, thank you from the depths of my soul. That's fantastic. <laughs> that makes me feel good. That's honestly... That story is one of the reasons why we made Super Unknown the way it is. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, um, lots of people, yeah. Some great Gen X memories, partying to Soundgarden albums back in the 90s, college party time. Awesome job, Michael. Great time Thank in music you. history. Um, aside from artist personalities, what are the things that make a production so trying and difficult? <laughs> I mean, where do you start? I think that's well. I mean, th that part of it's number one. It really, you know, w once you take the artist personality out of the equation, you know, and let's say you're working with an artist who is just absolutely up for anything, wants to try everything, you know, is an absolute delight to be around, comes bounding into the studio every day with limitless energy and is positive and cheers everyone up. Um, this is a person who obviously doesn't exist. Uh, and 
you know, and, and you've got the, that whole ingredient out of the way. And also their interaction with everyone, if they've got a band in their band, is just stellar. They're all friendly. They love each other. There's no tension, no nothing. My, my, my response to that would be, it's really a matter of what kind of commitment you as the producer are prepared to make. Once you decide to go down that rabbit hole, if you have a vision for it, your job of trying to realize that vision and how, just how far you want to go, uh, that's where the complexity and the issues come in. Because then you're looking at all sorts of technical problems and also like how you're going to, you know, how, how you're going to take this abstract idea of making the greatest record for this artist and taking that from an abstract concept into concrete reality. You know, that process can be extremely difficult, time consuming. And if you've got the funds, extremely expensive as well. You know, getting a big drum <laughs> sound, for example, it's not just, a, it's not e as easy as getting, always as getting a, you know, a great drummer in a great room, you know, with, with, with a, with a big, <laughs> big drum set, you know, it's like, placing mics where do you put the drums you know in my case i have always liked amplifying drums i always like to to kick you know bass drum through subwoofers and things like that uh which is something that i that i learned from watching a guy named garth richardson work who's an extraordinary producer engineer himself uh and you know there's all these different ways like they, that you would that you would want to employ to get a particular type of sound I always saw it as not in general terms of I want to make the best record for this art well starting with that but kind of like how does that work from from in my in, in terms of my own methodology that would be trying to create instrument sounds that represent the musicians themselves that sound like the musicians are talking to you through them, communicating and are doing the things that I would like for them to do, like having that kind of immediacy and transient response and just that the speed of getting to a listener quickly, you know, and also texturally, how do they work? Do they represent the music well? You know, so there's like all these different things that kind of combine, at least in my head, to, to create this kind of overview and all that stuff that adds up to an, a personal investment in something. And if you make the personal investment, that's where you get the, that's where you get the other issues. Cause you know, as you know, Warren, there's lots of technical things that can come up, you know uh, there's also like, you know, what kind of, what kind of equipment are we going to use and trying a whole bunch of stuff and going through all that and maybe trying the, the artist's patience in the process. You know, they're going like, I just want to play. Why do you have to fiddle around with sounds? You know, <laughs> so it can be, as I said, it can be, it can be a bit of a rabbit hole to go down. Um, ultimately, I've always found it to be worth it, though. Absolutely. Um, and it shows, it shows in the, in the records. And we have a lot of Europeans watching. So um, maybe the Americans won't know this band, but the Danish band Mew, I'm getting quite a lot of people, uh, I don't know if that's the right way of pronouncing it because I'm not Danish. It is. Oh, okay. It cause... is. No, they, they, have, they, speak, they, they speak English better than most Americans I've met. I, I know a few Danish people and I would agree with that. They, they're yes. incredibly smart and articulate. Yes, they are. Yes. And, so, and great conversationalists. So, yes, I've, I've, I've been asked by several people, um, you know, what was it like making that record? Uh, it was, it was interesting. Um, it was, it was time consuming, but a lot of fun. I had a studio in Venice, uh, California down by the boardwalk and we just set up in there and, and camped. And, uh, you know, it was all, it was all done pretty piecemeal. It was interesting because there were times where they couldn't agree on stuff. Their guitarist, uh, Bo, who was, um, a really, really important facet of the band and sadly no longer with them. Uh, he also had a tendency to kind of, to, to try and uh, dominate everyone else, you know, and, uh, and, and kind of get them to, to do what he wanted, which wasn't always the right thing to do. Uh, so there was actually a lot of tension in the band at times. And 
from that perspective, it wasn't always an easy record to make. Uh, and it, it also took some effort trying to kind of trying to make the record work the way the band wanted it to, because some of the songs kind of flow together. So we had to make sure the timing of everything was right, that the edit the edits of everything were right. That you know, and since we couldn't really listen to everything uh, in one whole piece, we just had to trust that it would all work out fine when we went to master. Uh, there was a lot of guesswork that was kind of like sewing two pieces of cooked spaghetti together, <laughs> really. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it, it was a lot of fun, you know, getting guitar sounds. That was very time consuming as well. And we had one other issue because working down in Venice, uh, we were taking city power. So we were on the, we were on the, um, the grid down there in Venice and we did most of the record through the summertime. And I had a, uh, apparently there was a power conditioner. Appar I say apparently because <laughs> even though I was told when I, when I started renting the place, yes, there's a power conditioner in here. I can't say for certain how well it worked. I know there wasn't a voltage stabilizer. So it kind of made the conditioning sort of moot. So every day at around five or six, I would notice that everything in the studio would change sonically. Like we would go from having these vibrant, bright, exciting, robust sounds to these really dull, flat sounds. Mm. And this was in almost everything, you know, like mainly tube stuff. So doing a little bit of guesswork and a little bit of research, I discover, I, I realize, and you applying a little bit of logic as well. I realized that this was happening roughly, roughly around the time that everyone in the, in the surrounding area was coming back home from work <laughs> and oh, they were yep, turning yep. on their air conditioners yep, and it was yep. pulling down the grid. So it was affecting the power that was coming into the studio. So we kind of had to work around this. I mean, no one had the bright idea of actually getting voltage stabilizers or some way to kind of correct it. Uh, so we kind of had to we, we had to deal with the hand that that we'd been that we'd been dealt at that point in time. But it was that that, that was definitely something that slowed us down a lot. Talk about troubleshooting stuff. Oh, that's oh. fun. Up in the hills, do you ever have that issue? We do. Um, in the height of summer, I'm looking over at my power conditioner over there. At the height of summer, um, it can drop below 100. And um, we've had a few 90 kind of days. And with the SSL, Ooh. it definitely doesn't like it. So I don't, I can deal with it in some circumstances, but it's really tough when you're mixing and you're trying to recall a mix <laughs> and, you, and you, you're like, why is this doesn't, doesn't feel as full on the low end? And it's, yeah, yeah, it's definitely power dropping down. So I know what you mean. Let me ask you a question. Do you have yeah. a stabilizer in there too? Well, we do. We have, we, we, we have like minor ones. Um, the, the thing is the last couple of years, we haven't had such a big of a problem. Um, it's interesting. I don't know whether they, uh, they made the power more stable up here. Um, but it hasn't been as big of a problem. We did actually have a, a fuse box issue and things weren't seated properly. And yeah, there's a whole other long discussion. Ooh, um, yeah. But when we were doing the Aerosmith record in 2011, it was really frustrating. It was super frustrating, <laughs> um, you know, because I was getting, you know, um, uh, I was getting some comments about the low end. I prefer the low end on this mix to that mix. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, and you just have to. Yeah you know, open it. And it was always, yeah, 5 p.m. on. People coming home from work, flicking on the, the AC, yep. and suddenly, suddenly the power was like, yeah. So, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Um, and um, I, I had a studio next to a, a, a big, uh, on uh, Formosa and Willoughby, and that was next to that huge um, power grid thing. You know, it was massive. Ooh. And we, we used to get like a buzz, like a zzz, because we're right next to it. Um, which we did figure out eventually, but yeah, there's always. LA is an interesting city for those people that aren't in Los Angeles. It's a big sprawling metropolis of like roads that need to be rebuilt, of infrastructure that needs billions of dollars spent on it, and power. Even the fiber here is it's crazy. The it, the internet's yeah. not very fast here. Um, you know, I, somebody 
considering this is supposedly the home of entertainment, it's amazing how slow our internet is and how unreliable our power is. But uh, oh yeah, it is what crazy. it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. It it is what it is. Uh, but but don't worry because electricity is a pain in the butt everywhere. <laughs> where, where I am right now, uh, I've had to just I've had to jump through all kinds of crazy hoops to stabilize it for for what I do. So right. it's you know it's a pain in, and you would think it's better up here, but it but it really it, it it's got its own issues. And we've got we've actually got super fast internet up here. You know it's like it's kind of like European speed, right? But, uh, you know, but we also have trouble with the, you know, with the line sometimes. So it kind of, you know, it gets bogged down by a lot of things. So unless you're in Europe, I think where they really take it seriously, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're facing down some issues. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a, a shock uh, moving over here when I, I noticed the, the, the differences, but um, you know, at the same time, I drove on Mulholland today you know, with the roof down on my car and the sun was out and the view was beautiful. And, uh, you know, I, I can deal with it to live in L.A. <laughs> it could be worse. It could be worse. It could, yeah. it could be worse. Yeah. It could be Absolutely. really cold and pouring with rain, which it, it ba is back home where I'm from. So, <laughs> yeah, it's actually pretty rainy here a lot as well. Uh, but of course, we we're on an island and the views here. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know you were on wow. an island. Oh yes, Vancouver I did know. Yeah, Island. yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Vancouver yeah. Island. On on a clear day from certain spots, you can see all the way into the states. Like I can see well into Washington State from here. It's ridiculous. That's I've amazing. never seen such clear air in my life. It's gorgeous. Oh, God, what views! Anyway, digression. that's amazing. No, no, no. It's a great digression. <laughs> um. So, yeah. so you mentioned Garth earlier. Are are you neighbors? Are you close? Uh, we're. Uh, he's on another island. Oh, Actually, he's on a different no, island. He's not on. He's not on the. I don't. He's on the Sunshine Coast. I don't know if that's an island. Oh, uh, uh, okay. It's further up though. It's more remote than this. His property is gorgeous. I've yet to go up there and visit, but I'm looking forward to. He's a good man, that Garth. He is. He's a lovely. We we had a lovely chat. He's wonderful. Um, yes. So got some questions here, some technical ones. Sean Gordon says, Tom Lord Algie said that Manson didn't double track his vocals and it was mostly an even tide. He goes, but I can absolutely hear discrete tracks on every verse and chorus, lots of tracks. Please, please clarify. Did Manson double track his vocals on Mechanical Animals? It depends what song. You know, I think it was kind of a, he, it was, it was really a, a question of, of, I'm trying to remember what songs where he didn't. Uh, but I'm pretty sure on, on dope show. Yeah. He, he double tracked his voice on there. He would always double. I mean, there would always be stacks of vocals on, 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 on choruses and things like that, you know? Right. He liked, I, I think trying to remember, he sometimes would record to tape with the even tide. I know I'm pretty sure that he used it sometimes for monitoring. Um, right. but yeah, he did a right. lot of double tracking on that record for sure. Right. Yeah. That's what I, that's what sounded like that to me as well. So I'm not yeah. sure. And a but, lot of really big stacks too on, on some choruses, like obviously in dope show, it's like just a big heap of Manson on that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking uh, for some other questions here. Lots of comments and, and about super unknown and mechanical albums as being fantastic records, which thank you. Thank you really agree with um just scrolling through comments did ask some questions here i know you, uh, we appreciate all the positive stuff but if you have some technical questions um i think a lot of people do want to know about guitar sounds in general um you know i know you and i when we talked about mechanical animals um talked about what was it the 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 arp the 2500 uh, 26 2600 c there you go <laughs> the 2600 that's okay yeah i wish i had a 2500 i probably would have used it yeah and that was a big part of the sound of playing through that um do you have any other sort of like little any ex particular memories of, of you because the guitar sounds on both animals of uh, both both albums are very unique yeah what both mechanical animals and super unknown yeah yeah yeah, but two different approaches, obviously different guitarists. You know, 
again, this goes back to the whole idea of trying to create a bespoke sound for the artist and get something that sounds like them, as opposed to like taking, you know, here's your Marshall amp, here's your cab, put a 57 on it, play a Les Paul, done, you know, <laughs> through a Neve module. Um, I've never been that guy, you know, and Super Unknown, it was, you know, most of the guitar sounds were done through a, uh, a Fawn uh, JMP 50 watt uh, 70s mm, half stack uh, with a slant cab. And we kind of AB'd with that and uh, Mesa dual rectifier. And I believe it was a Mesa cab on the, on the Mesa. You know, so we just, we just, uh, we, we'd AB those together. And that was pretty much the sound. Uh, and Chris had, had great guitars. I mean, he had a beautiful collection of, of guitars. He had that, he had those really awesome Gretches and he had that candy apple red, um, jazz master that was recently sold at auction, by the way. Oh, he did? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think he had one other, I can't remember what it was. And he was playing like 11 gauge strings as well, you know, so they were heavier. And I always like heavier strings for stuff like that. By the time we got to, by the time we got to Manton's record, though, I think I was up to 12s or even 13s. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 But I, I, I like, I like heavy gauge. It's harder to play, but man, the sound is so much better. Uh, of course, it depends on the guitarist, you know? I mean, Billy Gibson, Billy Gibson, Billy, Billy Gibbons plays like nines, I think. And yep. so did Paige. You know, and those guys have great tones. Yeah, well, uh, exactly. And I think actually, uh, in, a, in the late '60s, um, mid to late '60s, guys were buying like banjo strings, and I, I remember reading people were using seven and eight on the top E. Um, you know, oh no, whatever you could wow. do, whatever you could do to to bend strings. I mean, it was a it was an explosion. You know, that's um, wild. I yeah, didn't know that. That's funny. Yeah, you know. I, but on Manson's record, it was a whole different it was a whole different approach. You know, it was a different, a different guitarist, different sound, different music. It had to be crunchy, but I wanted to avoid something that would sound too metal. I didn't want to get the same kind of like tube compression sound, you know, with that kind of with that prototypical type of crunch uh, that was, you know, it's it's a very recognizable sound. I wanted something that was more sizzly and had more more distortion to it as opposed to like a really clean drive i mean when you know i first I mean? yeah absolutely when i first heard the record i just remember thinking oh the uh, manson's gone off and listened to a ton of bowie even though the record doesn't have any songs that sound like a bowie song it just feels like there's a massive bowie influence i mean was that discussion were you guys referencing anything or was it just in the air not me personally, no. I think that was really his kind of aesthetic for the record. I mean, it shows because he'd gone, just the, the visuals of it alone. The androgynous he, stuff, yeah, yeah. He'd gone from a very goth-type visual presentation to something that was more glam. He was made up, you know. He was, he was, he was all dolled up, you know. He looked rather sexy, you know. Yeah. And he was on the cover of that record, with, you know, with with... With genderless six, you know with six tits you know yeah, yeah. it was you know with with no nipples which yeah became a real sticking point with the record company as well like i think jimmy ivy was furious at him for that <laughs> actually oh wow yeah really funny but it was it was hysterical because i remember before the record came out there was a billboard for it up in times square and i just remember going to work every day because i was on a different project at that point seeing the billboard and going like that's my record up there, you know, yeah. in Times Square. It was really cool, you yeah. know, with the, you know, with the prosthetic boobs. Uh, I thought it was a really amazing visual statement. I mean, there was something about, like, it was very, it, he, he, he's, he was brilliant with the, with the visual stuff that he, that, that he was, that he was doing. Like the, the whole presentation was phenomenal, I thought. I, I loved it. There was something very futuristic and cold 
like the Bowie influence is, is definitely there. Like there's definitely, there's the sensibility of it more than there is the musical aspect. I of agree. It. Yeah. 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 You know, at the same time, there's a song on the record called, I don't like the drugs, which started out uh, completely differently. Like it was essentially based off um, the song fame. So it's originally it had more ding, 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 ding type guitar uh, guitar parts in it and the boom, a boom thing on the bass. And uh, at one point the song was being, re which I, I mean, it, it's a completely, it was a completely different direction than how it sounds on, on the record now. So it's interesting that you, that you uh, touch on the Bowie thing. And I think Manson got scared by someone who was doing a remix of the song who said to him, you know, my buddy Carlos Alomar, who played all the guitar on Fame, will sue your ass if you put the song out like that. You know, and I think Manson flipped out and he this other guy recorded a whole bunch of keyboard parts for it instead, which is really funny because Fame is essentially a rip of a James Brown song. Right. <laughs> right. So no one was going to go after anyone for that song, seeing as how all those parts are actually taken from someplace else. Yeah, I no. mean, it's look, it's what a strange. I mean, we can go off onto to where we're at now with 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 kind of the the lawsuit culture now that every any song that has three notes in a row that reminds you of another song now is a lawsuit. I I mean, uh, it's you know, don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot that we owe that needs to be repaid in uh, however we want to say it. I mean, you know, the, 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 one of the blessings of, of, of the British in the sixties is also one of its curses. And that was the fact that, you know, um, white British musicians in the early sixties through, you know, through for, from there on discovered blues in a massive way. And it became an huge part of where rock and metal grew from. Like, and that's absolutely incredible. But at the same time, they were taking blues songs and changing a couple of lyrics and keeping the riffs and the melodies and stuff and rewriting them as their own, you know, and maybe there's a naivety to it, which is sort of justifiable. But I think that's that, that I still love all of that stuff. And the fact that it allows people to go back and discover all of that music is important to me. But now we're in a weird culture, aren't we, where you know, everybody's getting sued, especially if your song is huge and somebody will come out of the woodwork with a song that was never successful and could never have been heard by the artist and said, I have those same three notes, therefore, where's my million dollars? It's, it's a weird place well, we're in. M music is uh, an evolving thing and it's a blending of cultures and genres and those are the albums I love, aren't they? You know, the albums we put on and yes. you're like... Oh my God, this has got like a reggae influence and this has got this as opposed to, oh my God, here's 10 songs that have exactly the same drum sound. And like you're saying, 57 and a Marshall, every single track, all the rhythms are done like this. And then... <laughs> Thievery is the pop artist stock and trade. That's the bottom line. <laughs> you know, there's no other way to put it. I'm not a fan of ripping other people off. Right. You know, they, see, but the thing is, is that life as well as pop music are full of contradictions that cannot possibly be logically reconciled. Right. You know what I mean? And that's one of them. I'm not a fan of ripping people off, but guess what? We wouldn't have evolved in music if something like that hadn't hadn't happened. Yeah. And you know what? When you got it, when you take someone's work and you get called out, you got to pay the price. That's fine. And yeah. that's the way yeah. it should. That's the way it should be. You know. I mean, look, look at what happened with George Harrison when he like, you know. I unconsciously plagiarized so he said you know uh, she's so he's so fine by the chiffons you know yep. he got sued and he lost you know yep. i had a lawyer back in new york an old school guy named harold ornstein who represented willie dixon when he took on led zeppelin for a whole lot of love like willie's daughter he was in he was in a room of his house willie's daughter like came running to him one day and was like, dad, I think they're playing your song on the radio. And he goes, he goes and hears it. It's a whole lot of love. And he's like, what? You know, because they took you need love, which was done by muddy waters. If you listen to that song, it's not an exact rip. What Jimmy page did, but they basically took the song and they converted it. Like you were saying into their song. They changed the history. They, they changed the entire framework of, of 
of all pop music with that one song, but they did it. And they stole someone else's work in the process. Willie sued him. He won. They had to give him, they had to give him a lot of money. And I remember Harold told me in the deposition, within the first five minutes, Page and Plant both gleefully admitted, yeah, we took the song. And that was pretty much it. They were gentlemen about it. They're like, you caught us out, you know, and they pay it up. That's ultimately, ultimately the way it should be. Now, we also live in an ambulance chasing culture where if you, you know, if someone smells a whiff of free money, you know, or happens to have a cell phone, a smartphone on at the right time, and can, you know, and can film some horrible sort of thing going on, video, some horrible sort of thing going on and make 10 grand by selling it to a newspaper or something like that or so on and so on, they're going to do it. If I hear something that sounds like my song, you know, that you've, that you've ripped off and I think I can squeeze a couple million dollars out of you. Sure. I'll take the risk. I'll have a run at it. Why not? You know, it's, it's free money. You know, if I lose, I lose. You know, yeah. obviously it, it's turned it's turned into a bit a sub business, a subculture in a business now, I think, where people are just sort of like they're waiting, you know, for, for someone to kind of, you know, to, to steal something that they've done so they can come after them, you know? Yeah. And it's it, it is interesting. Um, I suppose it's all about balance, isn't it? Because uh, a successful successful artists don't always sue each other if they feel like they have borrowed because they're probably self-aware that they've probably done the same thing themselves. Um, Let me give you a great example of what please. you just said. Yep. Not meaning to interrupt. No, no, please interrupt. Pink Pink Floyd wrote a song called Echoes, which is on their, their record Metal. I'm sure you know it's one of it's an Very amazing well. song. I love it. Yeah. But it's also got that little that little motif, that descending and ascending chromatic da 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 da. Well yeah. guess who borrowed that and put it in his music? The one and only Andrew Lloyd Webber in the Phantom of the Opera. Da 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 da. And that would have been a massive lawsuit right there. Roger Waters heard it and he was kind of like, it's a chromatic walk up and down. Who cares? And he just let it go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't I I don't need to go after this guy. Yeah. Which is which is which is interesting because you know Roger Roger Waters is very outspoken, but yeah, he has an understanding, and he, you know, it's what what do you gain? I mean, Roger Waters is not exactly poor, and uh, what does he gain? Yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. Yeah, you choose yeah. your choose your battles and your and your fights wisely. He could have, yeah, I mean, he could have just as easily gone after Andrew Lloyd Webber, and it would have been no contest because even though it's a chrome you know, simple chromatic walk up and down, and you might have had trouble saying that's mine, there's a pretty clear precedent for where that came from. You know? Yeah. I think the the the, the other thing is, is that, you know, the reality is, is like, there are only 12 notes, there's a lot of permutations, but there is such a thing as coincidence. And I think that uh, the difficulty is, is um, if we all know the, the George Harrison case, he admitted that he knew the song. But, yeah. um, and in a world where it was possible he might not, because in the, in the late 60s when uh, the Chiffons put out She's So Fine, um, it would actually be possible to have never heard it. These days, because we have this wonderful internet that we're talking on, it's pretty hard. Once it's out, it, anybody could possibly access it, and um, yeah, so yeah. it's changed the nature of lawsuits a little bit. I, I just feel bad, um, or whatever the right phrase is. I, I, I just, I get dismayed sometimes when I just see another fresh lawsuit for something that it, it could just as easily be coincidence, like three note melodies and things like that. Um, and and the other thing is, is like somebody claiming that they had a three note melody stolen of a song that's not very good mm -hmm. you can see where i'm going applied yes. to a song that's massively successful because it's so good that just happens mm -hmm. to have one little piece of a, a melody that came from somewhere else that if you removed would still be an amazing song i think i yeah. hope i hope that juries and judges can take that into account it's like so there's a coincidence of this little piece here, but let's just mute it. Oh, still an incredible song. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 
it's a it's it's difficult because you're talking obviously about very ephemeral things and intellectual property is sort of sure you know how when you get into the real kind of like fine nuts and bolts you know of of trying to define these things and i guess trying to define creativity what does it mean what does it mean to compose a song even if you say well you know de minimis usage of a song i think at this point i think it's like two bars of something mm-hmm. you know although based on the the cases that we're talking about it seems like people are trying to shave it down a little and kind of like get smaller chunks uh you know i mean it's it it's just so hard to kind of define and uh, you know obviously there are precedents within the, within the law to do so but still people are trying to take cases like this to court and you know obviously in terms of that um what was that Pharrell and what's his face song blurred lines or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're, you're not even talking about melodies anymore. You're talking about a vibe or like the, you know, the track, which in, uh, I guess in the past, that hasn't really been the basis for a lawsuit. You know, the yeah. basis for lawsuits were always lyrics and melodies. That was the copyrightable part of the song. So now you're talking about like, the track and the rhythm and things like that, which are a lot more nebulous. I mean, I've seen, I remember seeing the video of Pharrell do it being deposed and it was actually pretty funny because (laughs) I mean, he didn't really know what he was talking about and he obviously doesn't know a whole lot about music. He was really trying to capture the vibe. And I mean, unfortunately, the other side's attorney was just tripping him up right and left, and he was pissing Pharrell off pretty badly. But, I mean, at the same time, it's like trying to make Pharrell look like a fool doesn't necessarily make a stronger case for whether or not you've got a, you know, you've got like a, you know, some kind of legal standing against, you know, against the artist. I mean, everyone loves Marvin Gaye for sure. And the idea that someone could have ripped them off, you know, just kind of like looking at it from that context, that's pretty unpleasant, you know, and, and these guys didn't seem to, the, the plaintiffs didn't seem to be terribly likable people from the way they were presented by the, you know, by the lawyers, which I think is why they wound up losing. Yeah. But I mean, I don't really, but it, it's funny how they were able to kind of contextualize all those things into the case. And really you need to be talking about melodies and lyrics yeah. stealing the vibe of a song or borrowing it or whatever you want to call it i don't think that that's grounds for a lawsuit i just don't <laughs> i don't think that's i i think that ethically musically that's wrong then you can go back like you were saying before to thousands and thousands of old blues artists you know and and go like i'm gonna sue that one i'm gonna sue that one i'm gonna sue that one he stole my vibe you know I'm going to sue the Rolling Stones because they took their name from a song title of mine. You know, right. Muddy Waters, like his, his estate could go back after the Rolling Stones and say, you owe me a billion dollars for use of that, you know, because because you do. So pay up. What's it going to take? You know, <laughs> how yeah. about twenty dollars and some jawbreakers? We can settle out of court right now. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's 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 definitely a, a a complicated, messy kind of place. Yeah, I have I have so many mixed feelings because for me, obviously, the blues is, you know, I mean, you can almost take a slush fund of like, let's take one percent of all money that's generated in 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 music, and then just give it back to those blues artists because it's so hugely important in everything we do. But the one the analogy I was thinking of was. Um, was lust for life so here we have we have iggy pop working with bowie and uh, with bowie's band carlos santa comes up again in conversation obviously phenomenal guitar player and um they take can't hurry love boom 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 and write a freaking incredible song over it and um it's just the groove but mm-hmm. I don't, I, I don't think it's a lawsuit. I think what it is 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 like genius piece of like punk rock and new wave. It's nineteen seventy seven and just thinking outside the box and, you know, going back to another singer that doesn't have oh. a three three octave range that's just got so much expression. I mean, it doesn't get any better. And this then is, 
Yeah, yeah. This is, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like no, this no, is interrupt. What you're su- this is what you're supposed to be doing. This yeah, is what yeah, pop. Yeah. Like I was saying yeah. before, this is our stock and trade. Yeah. This is the stock and trade of popular artists. Like you don't. It's not. This is. I mean, it, I suppose even in classical music or even in concert music, you're basically there's a lot there's thievery going on there as well. I mean you had to have picked up things from the previous generation to get to where you are. That's progress. You don't, if you don't create in a vacuum, yeah. find me the artist who can say that they create in a vacuum. And I'm say, I'll, I'll tell you, they're lying out their ass. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. You have to accept that to turn that into something where people are looking over their shoulders every time they create something new. That's nonsense. I mean, I'll listen to things that people do, that are shameless imitations of someone else's work. You know, like when certain producers will, will, will say, okay, I'm going to make a song like the Gap Band now. And they basically take everything, like every yeah. single element from that would, would have been the Gap Band song from like the boom, da, boom, that type drum beat and a bum, 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 bum type bass synth. And they make a song out of it and, it and it winds up being a huge hit. You know, you know what? That's their prerogative. There should be no barriers to them being able to do that kind of thing. I mean, it would be really cool if they were original, but guess what? How do you get to be original? Maybe they're just maybe their idea of originality is digging into their like into their enormous record collection, you know, and finding records that were cool back in the day. Who cares? You know, you can do stuff. You you can take things like that and add your own twist to it. Some people will do it. Some people won't. The point is, if you turn things like that into something where a creative person is looking over their shoulder anytime they decide that they want to create a track, you're sti- it's just another way to stifle creativity. You can't turn that into a legal, you know, in, in, into, the, into the potential grounds for a lawsuit. It's not part of art. It's not how you create. You know, to be able to create, you have to be allowed to run off the chain free and unfettered. You know, blues artists got ripped off by everybody. You know, yeah. I mean, their record companies, I mean, Marshall, the Chess Brothers, they were notorious, you know, and guys like Mar- Morris Levy, who ripped off everyone who came into their purview. I mean, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, those guys should have been billionaires by the time they passed away. They weren't, you know, they still had to play gigs and stuff like that. I mean, they weren't, they didn't seem like they were hurting too badly, but obviously the world owes a debt of gratitude to those guys that will never possibly be repaid. Same with Muddy Waters, same with Helen Wolf. You know, they got ripped off, taken advantage of. You know, if they wanted something, the record company would buy them for buy it for them. You know, they didn't get any money. They got a new caddy if they wanted. They got a new house. That was it. They could eat. They were happy because they didn't know any better. No one said they didn't have lawyers who were saying, hey, you know what? Your record company owes you like a hundred million dollars. You better go get it. You know, it wasn't they didn't have a context for that. And they got ripped off. They are, and they've also been ripped off by rock artists, rock music, like a person picking up any person who picks up an electric guitar of any type right now owes Muddy Waters money. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that simple. Like there'd be no Led Zeppelin if it wasn't for that. There'd be no Led Zeppelin if it wasn't for Howling Wolf. It's all this stuff. For that matter, there'd be none of this if it wasn't for guys like Robert Johnson, you yeah. know, yeah. who was who, who died when he was 26. 26 years old, you know, and the guy changed the world. He didn't even know it. He has, he had no idea the effect he had on, on music. You know, this is, this is part of life. You know, there are going to be people and there have been people who did great. I mean, what about Bach? Like he was almost completely forgotten for like 200 years until like the mid 19th century when someone accidentally found one of his cello like his solo cello um pieces and all of a sudden the world started to rediscover the guy you know now he's considered one of the greatest composers of concert music who ever lived and rightly so you know things like this just happen in life you know for everyone to to have this attitude of i'm getting mine just because like someone did a carbon copy of a song you did without actually imitating the melody and the lyrics is silly You know, that's my rant for the day.
No, it's quite right. I think I think <laughs> I think mo mo most of mo most people here are in uh, agreement, or as our ex president used to say, agreeance. Agreeance, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I'll turn up my nose at someone who t who, t who lifts something off a record. I will, but that's yeah. my own personal opinion. That's my feeling about it. You know, it doesn't mean that they should stop doing what they're doing. I'm not part of like the you know like a moral or ethical kind of um, panel of judges who's allowed to sit in judgment on someone yeah. like that. But they created something that people like and it's successful. They should be allowed to continue on that path. Yeah, I mean, you look at Run DMC and Aerosmith. I mean, Run DMC were always, were had been rapping over just about da da ba da ba da da. They've been doing that for years and just you know. And when it was suggested they actually put it out as a song, they were like, mm -mm, you know, we're not we're not we're not doing that. It doesn't make it make any sense. And when Rick Rubin managed to convince it all to happen, I mean, it's it's an important record. It introduced, yeah. even though hip hop, as you know, you were there at the time and, and working with, with those artists. Um, so I don't need to be telling you, but I'll just, uh, as a way to get into the conversation. No, it's great, please. please. I mean, if it, if it wasn't for that, you know, hip hop, I mean, it would have eventually become more mainstream, but it was one of the, the, the big defining moments. No, that... you've got to say, you've got to say it. You've got yeah. to say it. There's yeah. no reason to edit your statement at all. You are 100% right. There's so much that led up to hip hop being what it is right now. And that is an important part. That's an important component in getting there. Absol absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 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 <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody, but it, it flew out. You know, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely important. right. I mean, what, yeah. let's get back to that period. So, so we 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 went to um, probably some of the obvious because you know those 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 incredible uh, '90s records you did are uh, uh, not only are they some of the best sounding records of that period of all time, but they're also, frankly, some of the biggest selling records of all time and that period in particular. But you got your start in New York, and and most people will um, will obviously know that from Herbie Hancock. Um, and talking about you know, you it's interesting. So you got you you got a, a a sort of a couple of white guys, dare I say it, coming in, and really you starting starting to help actually kick kick start the kind of hip hop revolution as well. I mean that's a a big record. I mean it, it, it was part of the lineage. You know, it's part an lineage, important right. part of the, it's an important part of the lineage. You know, like before, like I think the first truly large big record to bring hip hop to a, a larger audience was Rapture by De Debbie Harry. I mean, obviously the Sugar Hill Gang had had big records before that, but this was a record that really crossed over and made people aware of it. The only, the only problem was that it was considered more of a novelty record because this was out of character for the artists who did it. And people, and there weren't really that many other records around that I guess showcased hip hop music, you know? when see but there was like a there's a sequence of events here you know the first a, after that not including uh not not including the sugar hill gang records and stuff like and stuff like grandmaster flash um recordings like the message well, i guess you have to include that in there that's an important one you know because it really it really kind of was was almost like a slap in the face going like hey this this is going on, and it had a very important message as well, <laughs> hence the title. But then, you know, you've got craft work coming mm -hmm. with numbers, with computer world and that song numbers, which basically that was the beginning of the entire electro hip hop movement right there. You know, because a few months later, you've got Soul Sonic Force doing Planet Rock, which was essentially the beat two numbers and trans europe express combined because it had that did it did it did it and that boom that doom that doom which became like a major drum beat you know and that goes back to you comp you talking about you can't hurry love that drum beat it's the same idea you know i mean craft work were able to sue craft work wound up suing soul sonic forest uh, but it wasn't just because they used their drum beats. It was because they also put from Trans Europe Express, you know, so they wound up taking all their publishing away. So don't mess with craft work. Uh, 
you know, but you had those records, which are basic, which are creating this entire framework. And then after that, you had you had Buffalo Gals, which was another sort of like novelty mm -hmm. record by Malcolm McLaren. Well, you couldn't say Malcolm McLaren was really the artist, even though he put his name on it, you know, but there was that. And then there was a Magnificent Seven by, by The Clash, which was the first time I think a band, a, a record by a rock band got played on all the R&B stations in the States, you know, which was a real, that was, that just flipped everyone on their ears. So by the time we got to Rocket, there was, it was a culture that it obviously started in black communities. And it came, it came from toasting culture in Jamaica. And these Jamaican guys, I think DJ Cool Herc, who was really kind of like the first guy to be an MC, a proper MC and start spinning records like that. I think he came from Jamaica. So I think he imported that culture or if not, he was exposed to it in some way. So it started there and it had been filtered through so many different influences at that point. It wasn't really a stretch for two white guys to come along and work on a, you know, on a, a very influential black jazz artist record to make something that really kind of helped pro propel hip hop music into the fore because that was the first time that people were on a very large global scale were experiencing proper scratching. You know, that was, I, that was actually, that record has one of the most, if, I mean, certainly at the time, it was the most important scratch performance ever, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Uh, and it also popularized that particular song on the record, which is called The Fresh Scratch, which happened to be a sound that I'd made about a year, about, a year and a half, two years prior on, a, on a, that was on a completely different 12 inch. And funnily enough, this, the fresh scratch has become the most used, the most sampled sound in all of popular music. Wow. You know this? No, crazy? I didn't, but I do now. That's Isn't amazing. That yeah. So that was used on the, um, that's what DXT used to scratch on, on rocket. And all of a sudden this video is all over MTV. You know, and people are seeing that, the, you know, the craziness with the dummies and the toothpaste squirting all over the place, all over the place, you know, but they're also hearing the scratching in the drum machine and it's an instrumental track and it was completely out of place with everything else that was on MT in 1983, but it was huge. So there you go. It was crazy. It was the right place at the right time. Total kismet. Now, what? Dave had told me, and and you can tell me this is whether this is correct or not. David told me that um, this was sort of the last hurrah for Herbie at the label because his two was it two solo records before hadn't done well, and this was like there was mm -hmm. almost like they were like whatever, go do your record kind of thing, and and you guys just got to do whatever you wanted because they were this was like the last the the end of his deal or whatever. Herbie had done a series, a series of um, records uh, that were, I think they were his stab at trying to become a pop artist. I think he was trying to cross over and he just couldn't do it. And yeah, Dave is absolutely right. This was going to be Herbie's last record for uh, Columbia. That was it. You know, it was the irony was thick as, <laughs> as thick can be considering that, that, that Herbie's last record to throw away where we had like a shoestring budget to work with wound up being his biggest solo record ever, at least at that time. That's amazing. Funny. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Yeah. And Dave was there. Dave was like a very important component in that. That's Dave Jordan, by the way, we're talking about. Yes. Uh, Dave Jordan. Good, very friend. good man. Excellent. Incredibly talented producer, engineer, mixer. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and, and the reason why I met my wife, that's right. I forgot about that. I remember you told me about this. Yeah. Even better reason to have him in your life. Have you yep. spoken with him recently? I'll uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a, in a, in a, in a few minutes. There's a lot, lots uh, to talk about. Um, All right. Yeah. The no. So um, yeah, I, somebody said, uh, Ken says the video for rocket freaked me out as a kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty freaky. Uh, yeah. My, 
Another question says, Michael is brilliant. Can you talk about snare, EQ compression and reverb on on the whole or Manson albums? Um, said I, They said they just bought an SBX90. Any tips for that? Oh, I haven't used an, XBX, an SBX90 in years. Did you use it on uh, that album? No. Those albums. No. Oh, wait, wait. SPX, SPX90 or an SBX80? You said 90. So yeah, 90. Yeah, the Yamaha. Yeah, the the 90. S- yeah. yeah. Man, that's like antediluvian technology right there. I tried to, yeah. I mean, I had like a tiny studio on St. Mark's Place in, in Manhattan. And that was like one of my special pieces of equipment. But yeah, I mean, that, that was a great, that was really fantastic when I had it. Um, but I haven't used one in many, many years. As far as snare recording... On, on the whole record, well, uh, it started to have a really excellent drummer. That was, uh, that, that, was a, that was a good place to begin. I'm trying to remember what kind of snare we used. Hmm. Did you Might use have drum? Been a Black Beauty? Was it Drum Doctor? Did you use Drum Doctor? Yes. Yes. So he, he tends to I'm be. Pretty sure. Yeah, he tends to be Black Beauties and, of course, the Bell Brass. He has that famous t- Tama Bell Brass. I don't know if you would have used it on that record. So that's pretty yeah, pretty massive. I didn't I didn't know what a bell brass snare was back then. Uh, on the Soundgarden record, we'd use the pipe, one of these Keplinger pipe drums. I think that was a prototype of his. So that was like my first experience with a drum like that, with a super heavy, like you know, single construction, like no parts welded together, or anything type snare drum. Uh, but on the whole record, I'm pretty sure it was a Black Beauty. Uh, we did have a 28 inch bass drum. So that, that was fun. I like those a great deal. And uh, I'm pretty sure on the top we had a 57 and on the bottom an, uh, a um, MD441 Sennheiser. And I, from about 19, from the Soundgarden record on, I, and I've spoken about this before, have always favored these Neve 1073 uh, mic pre amp equalizers uh, no 1057 not 1073 1057 the germanium ones uh i have never heard a mic preamp yet that is as fat as that and uh it's not as fast as an old api as like a 312 or something like that but it just has this width and this girth that's just uncanny just amazing so that was most of the drum sound right there a lot of what you would have heard as far as compression and eq would have been in the mix and that would have been in tom lord algae's uh wheelhouse uh but i'm happy to say he had exquisitely good drum sounds to work with so good 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 yes um hum says please can we talk about the band material Featuring Beinhorn and Bill Laswell, particularly Michael Synth's work. No info on, on the internet about it or them. Yes, I should really have brought that up earlier when we talked about obviously you working with Herbie. Did you get hired um, because of the band? Uh, let's, let's find out a little bit more about the band and how you how that morphed into working with Herbie. Well, Material started out as kind of like an oddball collective. <laughs> it's funny because I'm actually writing a book about this as well. So any questions that need to be answered, you'll find out soon enough if you're interested in uh, Material and Rocket and all that other good stuff. But Material was basically a collective. It started out as a band. We played a lot of shows in New York. I had a micro Moog synthesizer. That's all I had. I was so poor that I couldn't afford anything else. And from there, I would, you know, I would borrow things from people. I was very fortunate to have a friend who loaned me an, an EMS AKS Cynthia, which I used for a couple of performances, which is still one of my favorite synthesizers of all time. And at one point, I got a Prophet 5, which was an incredible step up. And, you know, it, we, we kind of morphed from being a band into kind of like a production team, myself and Laswell. And we made records where we brought in a lot of like people from the local jazz scene. And then we tried to do an R&B record, which was kind of like, you know, it kind of had a couple of things that were cool, but we had 
people on it like Niall Rogers and Nona Hendricks, who are phenomenal in their own rights. Oh, and Tony Thompson. We all know Tony, one of the greatest yep. drummers ever. And, you know, so we were making these, you know, weird records. We tried to we tried to put our hats in the ring for R&B. And it was sort of like, OK, but it wasn't like, you know, hit record grade level type stuff. And then we started messing around with hip hop. And Herbie had reached out to material before through his assistant, a guy named Tony Milant, who's uh, sadly deceased. But Herbie was only interested in working with Bill and our drummer at the time, Fred Moore, who's all since gone on to be a producer in his own right. Uh, and when Herbie came back to us the second time, it wasn't about the rhythm section anymore. It was about having us produce, write and produce two tracks for him. So we kind of dove in to that process and we knew what Herbie's situation was. We knew that he basically didn't have any cards to play at this point. This was sort of his swan song. Columbia weren't giving him a whole lot of money to do it. And we could do pretty much whatever we wanted. We had carte blanche, you know, <clears throat> So that since there were no holds barred and we had this great legendary jazz artist to work with, we basically had this incredible palette to work with, you know, and since we were interested in hip hop, since it was music of the times. And I obviously had an inside track on using electronics. And Herbie was a synth player as well. It was definitely a through line there. And, you know, we just we milked it. And the results are what you hear on that record. We went on since those the two tracks that we did, Rocket, and then, and the other one was called the uh, Earth Beat. When when they heard it, they when Herbie and everyone uh, heard these things finished, they were kind of like originally they they planned on having other people produce and write other songs for the record. They're like these guys got to finish the record. So it was all kind of it all wound up being on us, and you know, and that's how it, that's how it came together. Absolutely amazing. So, um, yep. Lloyd says, I saw you at the 930 Club and you had a Profit 5. The 930 Club? Wait, yep. when was this? I, I don't know. Oh, wow. I only remember playing the 930 Club and we, we did this really weird tour with a bunch of European musicians um, in... We were playing with David Allen from Gong. Do you remember that oh, band? Of course I remember Gong, yeah. Yes, yeah. so we did Radio, Radio Gnome Invisible, yeah. Um, That's yeah. right, yeah. Cam yeah. Camembert Electrique. Yeah. Yeah, you know them. You know oh, them. I know so Gong very well. Yeah, I, lo I know my prog. We can go on. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> we found another, oh, found another, another layer, layer. Parody here. Another layer. Funny. <laughs> yeah, we could, go, we could talk about Can. We could talk about Camel, Caravan, all the seas. Yeah. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, I've, I've oh. got a huge prog fan. Yeah, all the Canterbury scene stuff and German bands and oh yeah, Mother Hatfield Upduff. in the north. Yeah, have, oh, of course, boy. Hatfield in the north. Yeah. Oh my and, goodness. And in the land of grey and pink, where only golf girls go to think. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> Those horrible grimly grumblies will be climbing down your chimney. Trust me, I'm uh, no caravan. Hatfield in the north. Love those bands. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Richard Sinclair, wow. um, Andy Latimer. Oh, he's I mean, great. Incredible musicians. Yeah. 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 Their keyboard player, Dave Stewart, he's amazing. Yep. Yeah. The he's so the, good. The Dave Stewart, not the second Dave yeah. Stewart. <laughs> not the second, not the, not the successful Not the other, one. not the other great <laughs> one. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. As far as like playing at the 930 club, damn, I wish I could remember this. I don't even remember leaving, leaving the city to play any gigs around the time that I had the profit. Um, I'm, I'm impressed that you made it to the 930 Club to see us. All, all I can say is thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for coming out. I did. I when I came to America the first time, I played the old 930 before they moved to the quote unquote new location 25 years ago, <laughs> the new one. And I remember <laughs> yeah. it was totally rat infested, wasn't it? Like backstage, it was like scurrying rats everywhere. It was like it was a dump the original one. But I'm glad I, I think played I it. I think I blocked most of it out. It was so traumatic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but so I, did, I can't remember being there. I did get to play this, uh, play CBGBs a couple of times when I first moved over here. So I'm really glad about Ooh. that. Oh, yeah. boy. What a, what an experience, huh? Yeah. 
all I can remember is like, first of all, I mean, you you know it better than me. Obviously, you're you're a New Yorker, but like that narrow when you come in. So like the bars on the left hand side when you come in. But the funniest yep. thing is like to get to the bathroom, you have to walk in front of the stage. So you're like yep. kind of playing and you're just watching this procession of guys coming in and out of the bathroom, like below you. It's really funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was definitely a trial by fire playing at that place. I mean, if yeah. you couldn't hack it at Stevie's, that was pretty much. Yeah. That was it. But you had to, you know, you had to deal with so much. I'm just glad that I wasn't in like that first wave of punk bands that played there. I had a friend who played in a band called The Blessed. And I think he was like 13 or something. He played drums. And wow. That was the first time I went to CB's. And it was just really traumatic for me because it was kind of like the inception of like the whole punk rock scene. Yeah. And everyone's got leather jackets on. You just get this sense of like menace everywhere. And there was this constant, like, just a rain, a constant rain of spit coming to and fro from the stage, <laughs> from, the, from the performers into the audience, from the audience. But it was just like, I mean, you could see it in the lights. They were just being hammered with, like, just getting gobbed on, like, nonstop. <laughs> it, I'd never seen anything like it. It was like, you know, it must have been, it was kind of like, well, many stages down from being in the Coliseum and watching, like, gladiators or something. You know, at least no one was getting chopped up, but yeah. it was pretty, it was, it was pretty traumatic, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, there's a couple of things. Paul Holmes said he supported Gong. That's pretty awesome. When was that, Paul? And then Pat Kelly says, Bless you. says I took David Allen for breakfast once. He wanted ice cream. <laughs> ah! <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, man, that's hysterical. Yeah, what a character. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I've got to get going in a few minutes because I've got to go and pick up my daughter from school. She gets out early today. And my wife oh, nice. my wife is in D.C. talking of uh, talking of D.C. Um, oh, how is Mrs. Hewitt? She's, she's good, yeah. She's, she went to go and see Jack White play. So oh, she, wow. She flew out there to be with a friend and go and see Jack White play. So that's Nice. What, Please send my best. Will do, yeah. They're they're playing the play. He's playing. Uh, I don't know where he's playing in DC tonight, but yeah. Um, so I'm sure they'll they'll have fun. But this has yeah. been amazing as ever. We should do these more often. I, I, everybody has been so complimentary about the discussion. Oh, here's here's one here's one last gear question. Let's get a gear question. What are your favorite mic combinations for recording electric guitars? Do you have thoughts on a 67 on guitar cabs? Um, yeah. What do what, do you have any favorite combinations and do you like a 67 on guitars 67s are amazing on guitars i've never actually been in a situation where i liked where the way it wound up sounding compared to the other choices i had um i know that was like a go-to for mutt lang for a long time especially using smaller amps so with a smaller amp i think that was probably that would probably be in it i mean 67 is one of the great workhorse mics of all time it's just like you know it's unless you've got a bum one, you can't really go too far wrong with it. It's just it's and it, I think it's largely unsung in a lot of ways. Like people say are, are more up on like 47s and things like that. But the 67 is just what a great microphone that is. As far as as far as um, speaker cabinets, I mean, I like 57s. I like BK5s. Fire M160s are great. A AT4047s are great. Um, it, it just really depends on the tone. It depends on the player. It depends on the guitar. It depends on the amp. You know, it depends on the mic pre's. I, I mean, I get into cables and stuff like that and like mess with those and see which cables sound best with the mics. You know, it's, it's, it's like there's, there's so many different fun things to try and, you know, the combinations, I'll never go with one microphone on a, on a, on a speaker cab and I, I can't do it. <laughs> I just can't do it. I mean, especially because by the time you, I get to the point where I've gotten, I've recorded, I'm getting into recording guitars, the drums and the bass are so massive. So I find like one single microphone tends to get swallowed up in all that massiveness. So I need like more tonality and like, and more range. And a 57, I mean, sure, it's a great microphone. Another amazing workhorse microphone that you can't go wrong with. Yeah. But it's to me, it just can't be the be all and end all. So when we recorded Cornell, for example, when he, we did his guitar stuff, 
that was a 57 in BK5 on both cabinets, like one, like a pair on each cabinet. BK5 is a great microphone, you know. It's another, like to me, it's another workhorse microphone. It just does stuff that a 57 can't, you know. It depends. Sometimes a condenser microphone sounds phenomenal. I did a recording, oh, I can't remember how long ago, where I was using an old RCA KU3, you know. I mean, obviously, you don't want to get too loud on one of the th those things because you'll pop the ribbon. But what a great mic that is. Oh, my God. It sounded so good. It just smoked everything that we had. And it was, it's funny because even though it's a ribbon mic, it was super fast. I know you've worked with those, right? Yeah, phenomenal. Yep. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's really, I thought it would be kind of sluggish and more kind of tone heavy, but it was pretty quick. I mean, it was like, it got an aspect of the transient response that the, that the 57 couldn't grab, you know? And I would have thought because 57 is a dynamic that, you know, well, it's certainly, it, the dynamics aren't, aren't that fast, actually. They just handle more transient response. But it definitely picked up a part of the transient response that the 57 just couldn't do. So, I mean, there's so many different combinations. My advice is that instead of finding like a handful of go-to mics is try everything and, you know, do pairs just to see how they kind of work together. You know, obviously you got to work a little bit with the phase on that, but you'd be amazed, if, you know, as to what you can do, even with minimal equipment. It's so much fun, you know? Amazing. What a nice yeah. way to end. You rock. Absolutely. You absolutely rock. Coming uh, from the man who rocks, I'll take it. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. No, you're fantastic. I've, I've enjoyed it. I, I, I know you're being sincere, but I must tell you, I've enjoyed this, I'm sure, at least as much as you have. And I would be, it would be a pleasure to do this again anytime. I love talking with you, Warren. You're a good I, man. I, thank you ever so much, Michael. It's, it's, a, it's a true honor to be able to talk to you. It's true to be your friend and talk about music with you um, and all the Vice other stuff. Vice versa. And all the yeah, other stuff that we talk about. new things that we have in common. Yeah. Isn't that wild? I'm glad you you you, you know some of the same prog as me. And, you know, um, especially and now, all right, can I, what about Gilgamesh? I had that record a long time ago. I do not have it anymore, but I did own it. Yes. I remember what, Gilgamesh. And about, Egg. And Egg. What about National Health? I had, I had two national health records. Oh, there you go. Um, I like them. I think I liked Hatfields in the North a little bit more. Love and Hatfield and North, yeah. Uh, yeah, those bands were great. I love, I mean, you mentioned Gilgamesh. Obviously, I love Steve Hillage. Yeah, yeah. His first solo record is a, that's, a, I still have that. That's a staple. I feel that's a good one. I, I, his, some, some, his guitar sounds, actually my hairs are standing on end. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I, I, yeah. And, and his, just his, his choice, the choices are just absolutely superb. He's, he's never, he's stupid, great. And he's not guitar y. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't sound like he's, how can I explain this in a better way? He doesn't seem to rely on any, any tricks or anything. He just seems to play music. Where I, as a guitar player, and like most guitar players, you know, we rely on guitar-y things that sound like mm -hmm. guitar players play. Hillage, yeah. half the time, when I heard it as a kid and I didn't, couldn't yet play guitar, I was like, I don't think those are guitars. That sounds like a synthesizer, you know? It, oh, it, yeah. It, you know, oh, God. I'm, 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 now I'm just like, I'm going over to my phone because I'm just like, want to pull up Spotify, you know? I just Yeah, wanna... what's the... Do you remember the last track on side one of, of Fish Rising, though? Was it the something of the snake or the whatever it is? Like yeah. it's all guitar. It's guitar. It's it's like about four or five tracks of guitar where he's creating this like beautiful wash behind him, and uh, and then he's he does like leads through a Leslie, um, and then there's like there's like volume pedal like wow things that come in and out. It's really meditative, gorgeous piece. This? You mean pentagramma spin? No, no, no. I think that's at the end of the record. No, this is like something of the snake or something. Oh, meditation snake. of the snake. Meditation, meditation of the snake. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, I mean, listen to what he's doing with the wah pedal. I mean. Oh, 
incredible. I remember the first time I heard that when I was little. I was like, what in God's name is that? That's what I that thought. That's so cool. I didn't know it was guitar. I mean, I knew it was yeah. a guitar player, but I was like, how do guitars do that? You know, between that and like Brian May with, with some of his stuff when he was doing like, oh, brother, you know, brass sections on guitar. It's oh. like, <laughs> oh, that guy. That yeah. guy. Oh, man. Yeah. As you said, we could go on and we, on. And we will. We'll, we'll do and it. On. We'll, we'll do it another time. I'll be counting the hours. You rock. Thanks ever so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks you, sir. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Appreciate so long. the kind Farewell. words. Have you desired au revoir? <laughs>